Educating, informing, serving. Fact TV, keeping government honest. You are watching a Fact TV presentation of the WNESU School Board Meeting. Special, special welcome to so many of the staff who are here uh, tonight. <laughs> Let me say that um, when Andy and I first put together the agenda for this meeting, our main purpose was really to celebrate the opening of the school year. And so he extended the invitation to all the school principals and staff to come and join us. And we're eager uh, to hear from you. So a special thank you to all of you who have, have come tonight. And in terms of introductions, which is, I'm not gonna go there yet. I'm going to ask each of the board chairs, in addition to me having on behalf of the supervisory union called this board to order, I'm gonna ask each of the other board chairs to call your board, that high school, that whatever the board is to order at this time, given that we have a quorum for most, if not all, of the boards here with us tonight. So just as a formality, given open meeting law, I'd like to ask for that. So Jason, I'll start with you, please. Um, thank you, Carol. I'd like to call the uh, meeting to order for the Bell's Falls Union High School Board at the WNESU board uh, at uh, 602 p.m. Very good, thank you. Uh, Priscilla. Um, I would like to call the Rockingham School Board to to order on behalf of the um, all school boards meeting. We have at least three of our five members here, so we do have a quorum. And I'm calling them to order at 6.02 p.m. Very good. Uh, Kathy, if you would. I don't know if we have a quorum, we only have three. You have three out of five, and that is the same board. Um, I'm Kathy Siano Goodwin, um, chair of the Grafton and Athens School Board. And I call this meeting to order for tonight's meeting. I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you very much. And the Westminster Board, I will call that board to order, please, at 6.02 p.m. Also, thank you for being here and those who are joining us by Zoom uh, as well. With respect to introductions, I'd like to ask all of the staff who are here this evening to introduce themselves. I'm going to wave introductions by board members and encourage the public to go to the SU website and look up each board and you'll see the names and the photographs of each there rather than our going around uh, the table uh, tonight. So starting over here, anybody please just introduce yourselves and what role you have within this overall supervisor union. Hi, I'm Tim Vizina and I help Andy with finance. <laughs> I'm Kate O'Connor. I work out of the district office and I'm a communications specialist. And I think it's good to stand as well so everybody can see you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. They're going to need the project. Hello. Uh, my name is Sarah Doran. I am the director of after school and summer programs. Thank you. And do project where, you know, the, this, this owl has to pick up your voices. Go ahead. I'm Ricky Adams. I'm the director of technology. Harley Sterling, school nutrition director. Okay. Deb Cardine, director of instruction and innovation. Laura Hazard, principal at Saxon River Elementary. Gary Kennedy, principal at Central Elementary. Hi, everyone. Angela Cartier. I'm the principal at Grafton Elementary School. Liz Hardy and the principal at Westminster High School. Hi, Stacey Alexander, director for student services. Hi, I'm Jennifer Keenan, the early ed program principal. Hi, I'm Henry Bailey, I'm the principal of the middle school. Hi, everyone. I'm Shelly Wilson. I'm the multi tiered systems of support coordinator for our district, and I work out of the central office. Nicole Barnett, I'm an assistant to the superintendent. Outstanding. Well, thank you. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. So those are all the uh, introductions for tonight. Adjustments to the agenda. I have two, actually, uh, to suggest to the group. 
Uh, that is that, again, when Andy and I were planning this meeting, we started with reports from the principals to get a feeling for how the school year was going to start. Directors, I think we probably won't be able to give all the time that would be warranted to that. And directors tend to be on the schedule for the school year anyway. So what I'd like to suggest is that we plan on hearing for the principals two to three minutes mm -hmm. each. And then there'd be time for members of the board of the given school that we're hearing from to ask a question or two, but not opening it up to every uh, every board at that time. And then secondly, I'd like to uh, suggest that we move under 6C, appointments and resignations, move that up to 6A so that that would precede our discussion of PCBs and uh, Monsanto tonight. Again, when Andy and I were working on this agenda, it was all about opening the school. It was that's really what it was all about. And we had a placeholder for any appointments that might be needed. Since that planning for this meeting has occurred, we now have some other important issues to address. But I think it's still incredibly important to hear from our principals and have us get ready for this exciting start of the new school year. So with that, next is um, communications and public comment. I'll ask to see if there is anyone from the public who would, I did that earlier, mm -hmm. uh, who might want to make a comment. Other than that, we'll go into reports from the principals. But is there anyone? I don't see any hands specific. All right, Eddie, if you'd make, if you'd make the introduction. Sure, I'd, I'd like to, you know, again, as Cheryl was saying, uh, one of the things I just wanted um, folks to be able to do in principles is to, from a community standpoint, but also just in all the boards, is just to hear from the principals of, you know, what their goals are working for this uh, coming year and um, a lot of the exciting stuff that we're looking forward to. So I think if, you know, if I can just defer and start with, Jennifer, if you don't mind. And could you come up to the front here though? Is that just because the owl will pick you up better? I'm sorry. Where's the front? The table. <laughs> I sit at the table. You may sit too. You can stand. Hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, so the year is off to an exciting start in pre-K where really thrilled that we've had a program expansion so this year we're going to have a full day full week option for our families um we spent the summer um hiring a lot of new staff for that expanded program and i'm hoping that that staffing is going to be finalized here later tonight so that we can open up all of our classrooms when school starts um one of the things we've done is last week we spent a full day loading in all of the new furniture for our new classroom. We had a lot of help from some Bellows Falls students and some community members um, to get that done quickly. And tomorrow my team is gathering to start setting up the new spaces. Um, we've got a brand new space at Central and we've got some new stuff at the Westminster site. Um, the, when after school starts, the pre-K team is going to go into the kindergarten rooms on the first couple days of school to support the new kindergartners as they transition to the beginning of their day on those first days, providing a higher student-teacher ratio in the classrooms for the first hour or so, which helps both the children, the children that we had, and also children we just get to meet that day, as well as the teachers on that first day. Um, the first Preschool day for most of our students is Tuesday, September 5th, and the three-year-old room, which is the new room at Central Elementary, the three-year-old room will open as soon as we get it licensed by Child Development Division. Our team is working to plan an open house curriculum evening for later in September, where we'll have the families come in and see the space and hear about preschool curriculum and the kind of learning that is going on and that will be going on throughout the year. We're just excited for a really great year. 
All right, well, with that, because the preschool program, early childhood program is an SU-wide mm -hmm. program, I would open uh, the uh, questions to anybody who might want to uh, from any of the board members at this time. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Just thank you. I know it was like a huge endeavor to, to do this work, but it's just, I, I've talked to so many preschool parents who are excited that they either have a full day option now or they're still able to have mm -hmm. part-time mm -hmm. and go. So I... Thank you for doing that. I know it's a lot of work and it was the parents are happy and I think it was great. Yeah. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. It's what I want is <laughs> the kids, everybody with us. Uh, Priscilla. Uh, Jennifer, would you tell us how many students there are already at each of their locations and and can you leave that me up here away from my computer? Um I have 41 students enrolled. The Westminster site is fully enrolled with um 16 children. I even have that, I can picture the visual. 10 of them are full day, full week, and six of them are part um, week. And that site is entirely full at this point. And the central elementary site has a classroom with 12 and a classroom with 13. So that um, leaves one spot. However, if again, the hiring goes through later on in the meeting, that will create a couple of extra part week slots at Central that I can then open. And that's 41 total. And I cannot tell you the towns, but there's children from all of the towns in all the places, pretty much. <clears throat> all right, that was good enough. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. If there are no other questions, we'll go ahead. Move yeah. ahead. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jennifer. I think I'm next on our list is Angela. So at Grafton this year, um, we are going to persevere, keep going, and we're not going to give up. Our ILT has identified a goal for perseverance um, with a lens on writing. Um, and this will be taught and assessed by all teachers through explicit tracking and progress monitoring. Um, student success will be measured both by their length of writing and the quality of their writing. Um, to welcome students back this year, we have some fun events planned. Um, on Monday, we are going to take a little party bus and visit our kids in Grafton and Athens from one o'clock till three. Um, we're gonna pass out cookies and goodie bags to our students along the route. And then the teachers um, and staff who are on the bus, we're gonna stop um, in Grafton and get a creamy. <laughs> and then um, on Tuesday, we have a smart cookie celebration um, from two to three on Tuesday, August 29th, where we will welcome students and families into the building. And our awesome PTO has planned a photo station um, some panther paw gift bags and some light refreshments. We're very excited. Angela, yeah, could could you just ILT for everybody? Oh yes, yeah. so that's um, our instructional leadership team. So there's a core group of teachers um, and the principal that came together um, once a month as a whole SU ILT, and then um, alternating every other week, our building ILTs met. Um, and their charge was really to like guide the instruction throughout the building. And last year, our big, our big goal of last year was to identify a, like a target and our focus. Um, and then the ILT member sort of brought the staff together so that the whole staff could sort of decide on where, where the need was and then come up with a goal um, and then how we're going to assess it this year. And Kathy, if any of the Grafton Athens board have any questions? No, so board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think next up we have Laura. There, Laura has it. Hello, everyone. So Think It, Speak It, Write It is SRES's focus this year. Our goal for students is to communicate their comprehension through speaking and writing as measured by MAP, Dibbles, teacher-made assessments, and shared rubrics. We have three events planned to welcome and engage students and families as we begin the year together. On Tuesday, August 29th, from 2 to 3, we will welcome students and families into the building to explore learning spaces, meet staff, and enjoy a treat. 
And then um, in September, early October, we will host a student-led open house. And then community building and a focus on growth mindset uh, will be at the heart of a circus residency with Wonderly's Big Top Adventures, September 18th through the 22nd, with a culminating family performance on the evening of the 22nd. Um, as we all know, the beginning of the school year is super exciting, and I'm looking forward to a year of learning, fun, and community building. Any questions? So any from the Rockingham board? Research is anything? No, I think we just appreciate all that you're doing and getting ready for those students. Sounds exciting. Thanks, it is, for Thank sure. You, Laura. Of course. <laughs> Harry Kennedy from Central. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's okay. It's good. Good evening. So Central is very excited. So we have this year, our focus um, will be reading and comprehension. And our learning um, phrase that we're using is read to know, write to show, and speak to grow. Um, that was our ILTs met last year and really decided that across all of grade levels. And everybody came up with it. Art did a contest, and so we have a visual that goes along with it, um, and that will be something that will be permeating throughout the year. So all students, our goal will be showing improvement in reading comprehension through reading, speaking, and writing, as measured by our MAP scores, BAS, communication rubrics, and then other assessments. And so we hope to reach know, write to show, and speak to grow. We have some very exciting things coming up. August 27th, it is a Sunday from 1 to 3. We have our back-to-school carnival with Park Place. Um, as mentioned before, there will be a dunk tank, so you'll just never know if we'll be getting dunked at that time. <laughs> and on Monday the 28th, we're very excited because we have a food experience with Food Connects for staff. There'll be a little challenge thrown down, so wait for that. Um, wait to see, so that should be fun. The 29th, from 315 to 415, we have our open house for families to come and a meet and greet to meet all the teachers. Hopefully all goes well tonight. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, and then on the 30th is the first day back, so 7.50 a.m., and we have for dismissal for kindergarten students at 11.45, so we have those first three days again as half days for kindergartners, and then on September 5th, everybody comes back full-time, so we're very excited to get started. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Jim, Chris, anything? It sounds like you've got an exciting year you do. plan with a great start, so thank you, Carrie. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Liz Hardy from Westminster Center School. So at Westminster, we um, are WCS, where we wonder, create, and learn. Our ILT focus, our targeted learning focus this year, we're focusing on comprehension through um, lesson structure, um, intentional language and reflective practices. And we are really looking forward to filling our halls with our students once again. Our first day is on the 30th, as we all know. Arrival at WCS is at 745. We'll have an open house, a meet and greet on the Monday before. So I believe that's the 28th, starting at 530. We welcome families into the building to meet new and returning staff, see classroom spaces, see learning spaces, and then we welcome everyone outside to our playground for um, an ice cream sandwich and some lemonade. <laughs> and the building will be closed at 630, but families are welcome to visit on the playground until um, until they feel the need to, to finish their evening. But we are just thrilled to have another great year. We have mostly a returning staff, so we are excited to just pick up where we left off in June. Are there any questions? Westminster Board, any, including uh, those online, if there are any questions for Liz? I have two very excited kids to go back. We're excited. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Liz, very much. Now we're right. transitioning to middle school. Middle school, Henry. Yeah. Are you going to roll? Uh, let's see. I'm really excited for this year. Obviously, being my first uh, full year as principal of the middle school uh, and the opportunities that are ahead uh, for us at the middle school, especially with our admin structure there now. Um, I have a great assistant principal and dean of students uh, who I've had the opportunity to work with all summer long on handbooks, um, taking a look at some supervisory responsibilities, and then obviously welcoming back staff and students. Um, staff on the 25th, well, technically the 28th will be our first full staff meeting. And then uh, 
with our kids coming back on the 30th, which we're really excited for. Um, I'm hoping that this new administrative structure, if you will, will be uh, beneficial not only to the staff, but obviously most importantly, our students, um, as we try to kind of curb the climate and culture of the middle school. That's kind of where where we're at and where we picked up, uh, you know, last year. And I'm hoping to, uh, you know, continue with that. So um, our ILTs, just like everybody else uh, here in the district, we met once a month. Uh, we started a little bit behind. We shouldn't say that we paused for a little bit um, during transition last year while we kind of regrouped. Um, but we were able to make a lot of headway with uh, the help of Brett Bishop in Focus Schools. Um, he did a lot of extra work to come out to us uh, outside of the normal time with uh, all other schools and with the district and, and really worked, uh, you know, kind of like with an intricate team. We have six members. Um, one from each grade level, as well as an interventionist that represents our ILT team at school. Um, we're looking at the four C's at the middle school, uh, communication, creativity, critical thinking, and community. Uh, we kind of have like a slo slogan, like our community is more than what you see. Um, and the way that we kind of put this out to our teachers, or if you want to call it like teacher language, um, all students at Bell Falls Middle School will demonstrate growth in their ability to effectively communicate across content areas using creativity and critical thinking within the school and broader community. So. There are all of our C's kind of tied in there. So that's the main focus. Um, I think community uh, through our students, um, not only in the walls of the building, but also the broader community as well. Um, and that's the most important piece. We're looking at doing a community barbecue on the 28th from three to five. Uh, we're working uh, to kind of put that together for families. It was something that used to exist from what I understand at the middle school from uh, conversation with older principals and um, staff of the middle school. So we're looking to kind of reach out to the community and kind of bring everybody uh, back together. Uh, my goal is to get as many parents to the school, in the school, around the school as possible uh, to kind of see what we're doing um, and just uh, really so they can appreciate um, our attention to the whole, uh, you know, um, creation of, of community and what that means here in Bells Falls. Um, we're looking at 243 students to open the year this year, which is actually up five students from the start of last year, um, which is impressive and something obviously you like to see uh, stabilize are the numbers there. Well, 40 fifth graders, um, 58 sixth graders, a large seventh grade class of 79 students, and then 66 eighth graders for a total of 243. Any questions? Or? Jim, Chris, any questions? Yeah, um, looking forward to it and um, we're almost ready with all teachers ready to start. Yep. So it sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you in this new leadership role. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Kelly O'Ryan, high school. Yeah. Apologies for my voice. <laughs> um, uh, one of our key goals this year at the high school, uh, as defined by our ILT last year, is that all students uh, in every class will demonstrate personal accountability through initiative and responsibility for learning, flexibility, including the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn, perseverance in challenging situations, and responsibility for personal decisions and actions as a member of the community. Our enrollment projections continue to climb currently at 335, and we're excited to formally kick things off with our Freshman Academy dinner on Monday, October 28th, and welcoming our families for an open house on Thursday, October 5th. The team has done a remarkable job this summer preparing the building and our community for a stellar year. And despite some of the ambiguity about what lies ahead, I'm unwavering in my confidence that we're gonna have a stellar year. So. I welcome any questions. Jason, if there are any high school board members who want to ask questions. Um, I just want to thank you for hitting the ground running and, and really making such an impact over the last you know few months that you've been here. Um, and also love the Dean of Students assistant principal model similar to the middle school. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, I think we've talked about this before, is that connection of working with the middle school and having the middle school work with the high school yeah. so that these these students coming up have the tools they necessarily have to be successful. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, with all new administration, I'm looking forward to excitement and 
new things at the high school. So, and I'm sure with watching you in action that you are perfectly capable of taking care of all that and exciting all those students. Would you give me a repeat on when your open open thing is for your families? Sure. Uh, the open house is Thursday, October 5th. Yeah. David? Mike? Okay. I just want to say uh, uh, thank you for all you've done. Um, in a short time, you, know, the, you can feel the energy that you've uh, you know, demonstrated in, in the team that you built around yourself. So uh, thank you, and uh, we all really look forward to a great year. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, despite what I said before, I think we have time to hear as briefly from each of the directors who might want to. We're doing fine with schedule. I don't yeah. know where they, because we didn't ask them to prepare anything, so they might be a little, but I don't know. Just a few want. comments. I think Sarah's first on your, your list here. Sarah, do you want? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm the director of summer and after, oh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah Doran. I am the director of after school and summer programs. Um, I began here a year ago in April. Um, I was excited to join this team. I came from a position where I worked with after school programs and I had the opportunity to see how much after school programs impact students um, that participate in programs. Um, last year we served 165 kids um, throughout the district um, in after school programs and then the summer the programs were for five weeks and we served uh, 220 kids. Um, I'm excited this year to continue to work with my staff. I have staff at each um, site um, and I'm excited. A lot of them are returning, which is great. Um, I'm excited to continue to work. I've been building um, relationships with people in the community, including Main Street Arts. Um, we brought on through Main Street Arts in Saxons River. Um, I paired with them and we found someone to do some theater work and after school programs. Um, I, the library programs in Rockingham was already existing, but I've been really trying to build and I think I'm gonna be able to get them in all the Rockingham schools. Um, and then we had Compass School kids from I think seventh and eighth grade who came to the Westminster schools and really helped aid in those after school programs. And then um, we also pair with the Nature Museum from Grafton as well. So we're just trying, I'm going to continue to build those relationships and bring in um, enriching program programs for the after school and summer programs. Any questions? I'm open to anybody on the board. The, uh, in the after, after school program, uh, is there a educational content? Is it, is, by that I mean, you know, you know, follow up in the day and homework and sure. you know, I mean those could you just elaborate on what sure. what the focus is yep. there? Um so each school is kind of in a different place right now. Um Westminster has traditionally been funded by 21C funds. Um and they that their programs have are have just been around longer and are functioning at a different level. They do have tutoring that we begin at the end of October, beginning of November, and that runs through May. Um, I believe that that was served 40 kids last year out of the 80 students that they served. Um, and that's on Monday and Wednesdays. Um, the middle school, we didn't have any tutors come on board last year. However, we did in the, I think it was in April, we started a homework club to really get that revamped as well so that kids could come in and have that support. Um, Saxons River, we are starting to discuss tutors as well. Um, and I'm missing one. Central. Central. Central is also a discussion as well. So it's it's on on my plate um, to get more of the tutoring services in, but sort of in the beginning stages. Thank you. Yeah. Lynn, can you get a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned all the schools yep. had after school. Uh, folks sure. doing it is that just the Rockingham folks or um, talking Westminster and Athens? So Westminster, or, or um, if if you're referring to Grafton, Grafton is not on that list right now. Last year when I came on board, um, it was uh really tough to get any staff involved. Um, the model that is 
is in place right now is that we have a site coordinator and then we have staff that fall under uh, under them. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a we have it designed for a Monday through Friday. Um, so Grafton, unfortunately, is not on that list. I tried all last year um, and stayed in touch with 21C to try and figure out some different solutions. Um, we did send out a survey at the end of last year, kind of gauging where parents were at, and we plan to do that again. Otherwise, the, uh, all the other schools with exceptional high school have after school programs. Mm -hmm. Can the Grafton and Athens kids go to one of the other schools for after school there? Um, so school there's a cut, there's a mixed answer. Um, for schools that have 21C funding, they actually don't, the, the state does not allow kids to come into those programs, unfortunately. Um, and I did look into um, Grafton students attending Saxon's River this year. Um, and I felt like I almost had it figured out, but then I found out from transportation that it was gonna be 45 minutes on the bus. So by the time they got there, they would have missed snack and outdoor movement and then really would essentially not even be there very long by the time they had to leave. So fortunately, that didn't, I loved the idea, but it didn't work out. All right. Well, thank you so much, yes. Sarah. No, thank you. I have you aboard. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. You're uh, Harley is next. Harley. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I will preface this um, if we can cut Harley a little slack. He's he's been here since five o'clock this morning. Wow, um, five fifty, right? <laughs> no food for us at all. <laughs> Thought about bringing popcorn. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. Um, we're having a great summer. We're really looking forward to this year. Um, first year with the implementation of the Universal School Meals Bill in Vermont where you know, every every kid in Vermont, um, except for independent schools, is gonna come to school every day knowing that uh, they don't need to worry about where their next meal is gonna come from. And they're gonna start their day with a free breakfast and uh, lunch in the middle of the day. And we're really excited about that. Um, just building a school culture where as a student in Douglas Falls High School last year said, it's not just that kids come to school and know they're gonna be taken care of, but um, they can feel empowered to take care of themselves, knowing that school is a place where they can come and meet their most basic needs and then go about into everything else that all these great folks are working on this year. So excited about that. Um, like I said, we're having a great summer. Summer food program is in full swing. Uh, we served 14,182 meals today. And um, that'll bring the grand total Pretty close to our last summer, which was 141,000 um, free meals for kids, which is most in the state of Vermont by a lot. And we're really proud of that because we worked really hard for that. Um, we're also really proud to have received the local food incentive grant last year for purchasing the most local food of any SFA in the state of Vermont as well. So building these systems to, to bring local food into the school in a way that works for everyone. Um, Got to see how important that is this summer with all of the all of the things that have been affecting our farmers, um, from the frost that killed the apple crop to the floods and everything else. Um, we've had an opportunity to really kind of work with our farmers and try to get what they have available, and maybe they, you know, can't necessarily sell thirty two thousand cucumbers. Um, so we've been able to bring that in and repurpose it and get it into our meal kits and. It's just been a nice reminder about how this program is built to be a more, you know, part of the more resilient food system that we're all trying to work for here in Vermont. So that's cool. And also really excited about a couple of um, grants we're going to be working on this year. We're going to be piloting a um, bulk organic milk from Miller Farm in Vernon um, at four schools to start. Um, and then hopefully expanding that to every school and then hopefully getting that pilot to work in such a way that other schools can take that on. And then we also have this healthy, hungry, hunger-free kids grant at Westminster, where we're going to start to work on some of the outdoor kitchen space and um, do a bunch of cool things there. So we got a lot of cool stuff going on this year, and we're looking forward to feeding kids and getting them ready to go to their day and, and learn. Question for Harley. Yeah. Thank you so much for your work. 
Yes, thank you. you. Is this a normal year yet? <laughs> this was looking like the first normal year. I think we said it out loud, and so I'll take responsibility for that. Can you define normal? Uh, no, I cannot. <laughs> the weekly meal games are amazing. We've gotten them all summer, and they're great because they're healthy, and the kids love them, and it must be so much work. I can't imagine, but we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's really hard to please everyone. Um, so, you know. We try. We try to go from kale to pop tart. Looks like. <laughs> Carly, can you speak to the percentage of local farmer produce that you incorporate into the program? Into the meal kit? Mm -hmm. No, into the whole of the school. <clears throat> okay, so last year, this is really cool. Thanks for that question, because last year was the first year that um, the state, in order to receive this grant called the Local Food Incentive, actually tracked everyone's invoices and said, show us the receipts. Mm -hmm which was really great because the first year of the program, I think there were over 20 people applied. Um, by that, I mean SFAs, school food authorities. And all you had to do was check a box, do you buy local? And then you had to check one more box, like how much? And so then this year, they actually, we had to be audited and um, we had the highest 27% Vermont product purchasing of any SFA in the, in the state. And an additional close to 10% that was disqualified for not meeting certain criteria. So, you know, if we buy chicken from Walpole, uh -huh. that not only does not, not count, it counts against you because it's about the percentage. Mm -hmm. So it's like denominator, numerator stuff going on. So the more you buy that's not <laughs> from Vermont, um, it counts against you. So we're really proud that we could still honor our um, commitments to our local farms and partners that aren't necessarily... Um, in Vermont, because like 75% of towns in the state were a border community. Um, yeah. So to be able to do both of those things was really, was really awesome. We're really mm -hmm. proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now you can go home. Absolutely. <laughs> keep walking. Keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> Will you jump to Shelly? Sure. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, to, uh, Shelly, can we jump to you? Yeah, I'm just finishing my speech. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone has a someone has a, a crook already to pull you off. <laughs> Talk about last night. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi. you. I'm going to do the best I can um, off the top of my head, but I did make a few notes while Harley was talking. <laughs> so, um, my uh, role in the district is as the multi-tiered systems of support coordinator. Multi-tiered systems of support is um, an initiative supported by definition, it's a framework that unifies educational opportunities to support and improve outcomes and ensure equity for all students. So that is a pretty um, very wide definition and there's a lot of structures that fit underneath that umbrella. So part of my uh, job responsibilities are to coordinate and oversee several of those systems that operate under that umbrella. So one of which is um, Section 504, which um, ensures access for students with disabilities through evaluation and team meetings and working with classroom teachers to make sure that um, students who may not qualify for special education services but otherwise have a disability have equal access to um, general education. Another process that I coordinate is the educational support team structure or EST. You might hear principals um, you know, talk about this at meetings as well. Um, EST structures are school-based teams that meet uh, periodically, usually bi-weekly, sometimes monthly, and they create individualized support plans for students um, based on our data collection in order to uh, provide intervention for students. It's designed to be uh, hopefully short term. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they also can env uh, provide enrichment for students if we have a student who's performing um, above grade level in a certain area. So it can be used for either purpose. Um, I'm also the District McKinney-Vento uh, Liaison. McKinney-Vento is a federal act that is, um, we are required to have a liaison who's responsible for identifying students who are homeless or otherwise housing insecure. 
And so part of my responsibilities with that um, part of my position is every August to make contact with families who may be experiencing homeless or housing insecurity and uh, determine their eligibility, which is a federally mandated process. And so that'll be part of my back to school work here um, in the next few weeks. Um, I oversee three home to school liaisons. It's actually 2.6, but um, that team of professionals um, is, they are phenomenal. They work directly with families with priority to families who are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. And they work with them on uh, helping kiddos stay engaged in school and come to school via attendance and also work to connect them to our community resources. Uh, which could include housing, like the Springfield housing folks or the Brattleboro housing folks. Um, and they, I really can't say enough about that program and the people that work on behalf of the students of our district. They've, they've been a great addition um, to our crew. Um, I also work to oversee the restorative practices initiative that our district mm -hmm. is, we're in a multi-year, I don't, I, this is only my second year for the district. I know that um, we've been in, we've been employing that um, strategy at the district level for quite some time. Carrie Newton is our district restorative practices coordinator, and so she works um, with me and will be um, in that position this year to ensure that um, those practices are in place at the classroom and also the administrative levels um, to uh, dovetail with with the responsive classroom initiative that we employ in our classrooms as well. And then I also sort of have a broad oversight charge of social emotional learning at the district level. So I've run um, point on the panorama system, which I know we've talked about a little bit at the board meeting. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more this year. We used the panorama data collection system to run our climate surveys. Last year, we did a student survey um, where we had about, it was just under 80% participation. It was like 78.9% of our students took the survey. And then we also did a family survey um, that was put out to the broader community and asked about topics of um, student engagement, barriers to engagement, and a lot of questions about um, students and families' perceptions of our schools and our systems. I'm sure uh, we'll be talking about that data at the board level at some point. Um, in our work as administrators, we're using that work to inform our um, continuous improvement plans at the district and school level. And that was all I got to. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions, please, sure. Cheryl. Okay, first question is McKinney Vento. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a handle on how widespread uh, the need for McKinney the Vento uh, services are across the district, maybe possibly as a percentage of the total mm -hmm. population? I, I would be able to provide an exact figure, but not off the top no, of my no, head. No, no, I, yeah, I, it's less than 5%. That's for still, sure, that's still a significant number. But it, there are definitely um, there are definitely quite a few families. I will say, totally anecdotally, off the top of my head, the data that we reported last year, because we are required to report that data um, federally and at the state level, the numbers were fairly stable from the during the last two school years. There's traditionally a lot of movement over the summer. And also, um, I've learned in November when, um, you know, there are some families who, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it, some families stay um, in campers and tents during the summer if needed. And when those close at the end of October, there's usually an influx of um, families who need those services. And so now um, this is my second year. So I'll be, I'll definitely know that that's a time of year to keep an eye on for sure. Thank you. The second question, Cheryl, is uh, when will Panorama results be shared with boards? I'm not sure if that's up to me, but. Well, there... I, re I realize that sure. maybe that's a more general question yeah. for the superintendent of schools. Absolutely. But I think that's information that boards absolutely mm -hmm. need to have a grasp of. And if you're assembling it, um, 
when you when you have it assembled, I would ask you to let Andy know and mm -hmm. get it scheduled so we can talk about it. Yeah, I anticipate that that would absolutely be a, um, a topic in future board meetings. At the, we just had our summer um, leadership uh, retreat where we met, and that was a topic of discussion. I know in future um, meetings with principals, the principals have their school data, and so we'll be talking again about, you know, here's the data, what does it mean, how do we use the data to inform our practice going forward. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate it. Stacy. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so student services is going through a significant change this year. Um, on July 1st of 2023, um, the special education rules change went into effect. Um, and that is around um, the adverse effect gate, which is what we call gate two, and how students um, are found eligible for special education, especially if they have a specific learning disability. Um, I will dig into that a bit more in September when I do my director's report um, to give you a more detailed information about that and how that's going. Um, we've been doing a lot of professional development around it, and I'm anxious for the staff to be able to dig in um, and see what this is going to do and how it's going to impact um, students across the state, not just in Wyndham Northeast. Um, secondly, I am looking forward to continuing work with um, Deb Cardane and her intervention team um, on how we can. Um, change our intervention structure and making it more cohesive and effective for all students um, and not be so siloed like we have in the past where this is a special education student and this is a student in general ed getting the intervention um, of how we can work as a team to help support all of our students um, to hopefully decrease our special education numbers and populations. So that's something we're going to be working on. Um, third, uh, we are implementing some executive functioning curriculum into our guided study at the high school. That's a special education supported study hall um, in an effort to um, help um, further the work that Kelly and her team are going to be doing with the portrait of a graduate. Um, this work will support students in understanding who they are as a learner, um, what strategies work best for them to study, to take in information, to plan, um, and will help them hopefully be successful in their four years at the high school. So there will be more to come on that as we dig in um, and see how that's going to work. Um, we are continuing to fill positions. I think that's the, the biggest thing on my plate right now is trying to hire. Um, we do have some teaching positions still open, but we are doing interviews weekly. Um, we have had some um, good candidates and we've hired a few. Um, through our placing agencies, um, but we do still have two positions at the middle school that we are interviewing for tomorrow, um, and hopefully we will find a couple of candidates to come on board. Questions? What positions in the middle school? Um, a 5-6 special educator and a 7-8 special educator. Five, five. Yep. The, is, uh, are there... Uh, you're talking about the educators, the, the, the special teachers, education teachers. Yes, yeah, the case manager. Uh, are all of the other uh, special ed teacher positions filled? Um, yes, they are. So the the four or five at the high school are filled, and the rest we do of have, are... Yep, we do have one um, virtual special ed teacher still at the high school who's going to be doing some um, reading tutorial and guided study work for us but all of the in-person instruction will be people within buildings. Yeah. But only, but two. We have two those. positions left to fill. Yep. We just filled the position in Grafton last week. So right. we'll hear more. We'll, we'll as, talk more about that. It, at the, as uh, soon as we, as soon just, as we hire. I just we'll, struggle with that. Uh, well, given that this is a, a given that the, the SU staff is, is, uh, is, is employed not by the town but by the SU, mm -hmm. and uh, according to the, our contract, uh, they can be assigned to uh, the schools that they're, uh, whatever school that they're yep. needed. It, it seems to always be a shortfall from those. So. I think we've had the most staff leave from the middle school. That's the school that seems to continue to have the turnaround, where some of the other schools, the staff has been steady. Um, the people that left this year, like Grafton, was a retirement. 
um, but the middle school seems to be where we um, struggle with turnover. And so we have two, three actually returning special educators in that building, and we're trying to hire two more in person with people that will stay for an extended period of time, not just a one year position, but people that are looking to move here and put down roots in our system and, and make an impact at the middle school. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Stacey. We'll see you throughout the year. And look yes, we will. To <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, oh, I'm having trouble hearing you for one thing. Stacey, okay. are all of those in person or I couldn't quite hear? Yes, the Grafton position was filled in person. Um, it, although it is a contracted position through an outside agency, um, the two positions at the middle school we are going to fill in person. Uh, we do have one virtual teacher at the high school, but they are um, filling a reading tutorial position and some guided study work, but they won't be doing any um, like core instruction types of things, but in person special educators will be doing that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ricky, real quick. <laughs> I got that real quick. We're going to give Jim a, a breather tonight. <laughs> Positive message might be a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting our year off. Uh, team member down, uh, Jamie Danbro, four years of service, uh, four great years, means left us, um, actively trying to fill that position, um, trying to see what would be the best fit in regards to skill set for that position going forward. Um, so starting off, it's myself and my team member, Andrew Petruski. Uh, thank you a lot to Andrew for um, all your hard work as we try to navigate our, the rest of our summer. Um, the majority of this summer and probably a few weeks into the school year has been infrastructure, it was purely infrastructure related, um, and setting up of new equipment for teachers, um, and just the general maintenance of equipment for students. So I don't know if everybody knows, we have a lot of staff, a lot of equipment out there. It was probably hands-on about 700 Chromebooks, right? Um, we recently received an order of MacBooks, one for basically a, a refresh for every uh, teacher. Um, they have the equipment they have right now is mixed age, some five, some seven years. Um, it's pretty uh, broad. Um, outside of that kind of infrastructure work and uh, prepping of equipment for actual humans, um, I, I personally handle a lot of our reporting. So the Kinney Bento numbers to the state are included in a report that I have to complete every year, um, actually kind of quarterly. So it's something that we report on constantly. Um, excited to have some new, I wouldn't call it cutting edge, but modern uh, infrastructure to help us troubleshoot throughout the year. So um, I think that's probably the, the most positive aspect we've got coming for us. Um, anybody want me to dive into Technology is a very deep pool. Um, <laughs> I don't quite know where the markers are. You could hit any any column you want. So any questions? Hi. Hi. I have a trouble code, Ricky. Can you fix my password? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's not as, as funny for me as it sounds, but uh, Google won't do it, and it's referring me to the system administrator, and I believe that would be you. That would be me. We'll talk offline. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Just don't turn off your phone, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 10 years. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> we appreciate all you doing. Yeah, I, I just want to point out to everyone that um, Ricky, and when he has a fully staffed department, is grossly understaffed for districts our size. And some districts that are our size have double the amount of staffing. Um, so I'm very appreciative of everything that Ricky does do. And, and he... He does have his tentacles or or web into a lot of places, and so. Thank you. Time to ask for a raise. You <laughs> <laughs> tax fair. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Deb. Hey, got my notes. Mm -hmm. Very fast. Very efficient. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about what we're getting ready to do. Um, I am the director of instruction innovation, mostly instruction because I think we all innovate. So 
Um, we have, we're coming off the end of a very busy summer. So the summer has been really prepping for the year in systems thinking, but also with some professional development. So I've had the pleasure this week of doing some really fun professional development with teachers across at three out of the four elementary schools. We've got a high school teacher there um, and quite a few specialists. And they are working to develop project-based learning um, units, units that where they're integrating content and science and social studies. We worked across the year digging back into what we call our scope and sequence. So the sequence of the content that we teach across K through 12. Um, social studies, I think the last time was 2009 that it was looked at. So a team of teachers came together and dug into that and started thinking about looking at the standards and how do they play across our grades. So we've started that work. That's going to be a year long process, probably beyond that as well. Um, last year, we taught, we dug into our literacy programming and um, identified a phonics program. So we'll be implementing that. Um, I'm really thrilled to have Kate Kane joining me this year working with teachers. And so she's going to be helping implement that um, the trainings around that phonics programming. And the other side of phonics program with literacy is building knowledge. So that's where that science and social studies um, work is gonna come in. The teachers this week have been really coming up with amazing ways that they're going to be implementing content, just not in their classrooms, but getting kids out into the community um, and really creating some exciting and integrated learning opportunities for our kids. So that's been really fun. Um, along with that, we are, um, we've got a coaches team that's kind of coming together. We've got a STEAM coach that has been, we've had coaches, but they work in isolation and they sometimes have a siloed kind of a feel. So we're going to be bringing them together this year as well with some professional development specific to coaching and how to support teachers and how to build their skills and knowledge. Um, so that's kind of instruction in a, in a nutshell. Assessment wise, we are implementing some new assessments K through six. Um, and we're really gonna spend this year digging into our seven through 12 portrait of how we know how our kids are doing. I'm aware that that's a gap and, and that's gonna be a year long focus for us. Um, we're really, my goal with assessment is to get the maximum amount of information with the minimum amount of teacher and student time. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a pretty good plan in place um, and our interventionists are really gonna be at the helm of that at the beginning of the year. We've got a lot of teachers who are going to get training across the year and jump in mid-year so that really when you are when you are working with a kid to assess them, the person there gets the most information. So we want as many people with the skills to do that as possible. Um, we're also going to be implementing monthly data meetings in every school. And um, professional development-wise, another category that I hold, uh, really focusing on collaboration and cohesion across seven or across K through 12 and pre-K through 12, really. Um, our, we've got a professional development plan that's gonna span the year, um, meaning teachers will tend to the same content across the year. It won't be like a, I'm doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We've also gone, we're gonna have time for seven through 12 grade teams to get together and meet um, four times across the year. So social studies department, seven through 12, will gather and do work together. Math department, seven through 12, will gather and do work. We're developing targeted professional development for our roles. So our teachers get to learn about things that, are, that matter to them. Our um, classroom teachers are in different professional development, perhaps than our art teachers and music teachers. So that's been a goal and um, it's looking like it's gonna be good. And lastly, we're working hard on our new tire orientation that starts next Tuesday. Uh, we've got all of our new hires named. They've all been invited. They all have mentors assigned to them. Um, and they'll be, we'll be at the middle school for three half days for trainings. And then they're going to get time in their classrooms and time with their principals in their buildings. Um, and we're excited to start the year. That's it. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Deb. Yeah. Square project based learning uh, with flexible pathways for me, please. Ooh, good one. Okay, so there's many names for the same. Many ways to skin the cat. Is that how they say? So there's plenty of overlap. Flexible. So in project-based learning, one of the key tenets is voice and choice, right? Where we say we want kids to be able to choose, have an element of choice and autonomy in their learning. An element. An element, or yeah, it's not a free for all, right? We're all going to. We want to make sure kids develop knowledge across time, so that, for instance. 
we might have a fifth grade teacher who loves U.S. history, a seventh grade teacher who loves U.S. history, an eighth grade teacher who loves U.S. history. If all of them teach U.S. history, we're missing something, right? Same thing if we give it all to the kids and say, choose your path, but we don't actually have a plan kind of guiding that path. We're the facilitators, right? We aren't ensuring, we're not doing our due diligence in ensuring that our kids are getting a comprehensive education. So an element of choice means perhaps they might choose how they represent their thinking, or perhaps they might choose um, a smaller category within a broader category. We as a teacher maybe chose animals and a kid chooses, they want to study a lemur, something along those lines. Does that make sense? I got you. Okay. Um, I would like to hear more about flexible pathways from you, but I'm also watching the clock. Yep. So maybe that discussion should be continued to a later meeting. I look forward to that. Richard, thank you. All right, outstanding. May it just be an outstanding school year, and we look forward to hearing from you throughout the year. I think with that, they can. Yeah. You're welcome to stay, and, 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 uh, and Jennifer, I need you to stay, though. That's the only person. So, so thank you very much, Dalton. So let's, let's move to that new business and appointments and resignation. So we actually have two appointments that we're asking, um, and these are SU employees. Um, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to speak to the first one. Can you, please? Mm -hmm. um, the. Um, I was kind of listening. Just stay, stay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the I am here to have Kathleen Carl, who is currently the kindergarten teacher mm -hmm. at Central, Terry's kindergarten teacher, to have her appointed as a licensed pre-K educator for the preschool program. And what we are asking is if um, the appointment can be um, based uh, contingent on uh, a suitable uh, replacement found for the kindergarten teacher and appointed by the Rockingham board. And, and I, I would make that motion, Andy, that we um, allow um, Kathleen Carl to move from uh, kindergarten to preschool, provided we have a suitable candidate for the um, kin current kindergarten position and that person has signed her contract. And Kathleen would be a master plus 15, step 12. Thank you. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Okay, add, add the master's plus 15. <laughs> step, step what? 12. 12. Okay, hey, motion on the floor. Any discussion? Yes. Um, I know you probably haven't advertised, but how hard do you think it's going to be at this point to hire? Kindergarten teacher. So, so we have a special meeting scheduled for Friday where <laughs> we're hoping we know we're bringing a candidate to the Rockingham board. Rockingham, that's very good. So, good. so, so we just, we just, so June, June just, we couldn't, we couldn't get the Rockingham meeting before this meeting. That's the only reason why. Okay. So. All right. There's a motion on the board. Any other comments, questions, discussion? Well, she need a provisional or she licensed pre K? Yes, pre -K? she's a very experienced pre K great. teacher who's been working in the kindergarten, and her secret dream is to come back to pre K. Mm -hmm. I like to make people's dreams come back. <laughs> All right, this is uh, actually an a SU board action, so I would ask only those supervisory union uh, board members to vote. And let me just do a quick uh, roll call. Uh, Chris, can you? Yay. Uh, Priscilla? Yes. 
Team? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Lynn Morgan? Yes. Cabin? <coughs> Mike Stack? Yes. June? Yes. Jason? Yes. And I don't think Hardy is with us. He's not. Okay, great. And then I will Kristen. David. Oh, Kristen Rock. Yes, sorry. Okay, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much. We have the next item. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. You've been. <laughs> um, the other uh, candidate we're bringing forward, uh, her name is Amy Harlow, um, and she would be a um, coming on as a um, title intervention teacher at Kern Hatton. Um, we are, as part of our um, LEA responsibilities, uh, we for, uh, and accepting the Title I funds, we do have to provide services uh, to some of our schools, independent schools that are in our area. So we do provide services at Compass, we provide services at Manhattan. Um, and so, um, Amy would be working at Kern Hatton, but we would be picking up a portion of her salary. Um, uh, she's only going to be a total of a 20 hours at Kern Hatton, so it has to do with a formula. Uh, we would be picking up about $9,000 of that, of her total salary. Um, so. Has it been offered to her, sorry, to also do more middle school? Where? Wasn't she working for us? Andy or not? I believe she did, yes. Years work for us in Sacramento Rivers. Yeah, she was the, she is the yeah. retired principal of Floodbrook. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Central School. So has it been offered for <laughs> to fill middle school? I don't yeah, know. I, <laughs> Sorry, Andy. There's no so, motion on the floor, may I say? But we should actually oh. properly do that and have a motion to hire. Her uh, for this part time position. I'll and make a motion. We can have discussion. I'll make a motion to hire Amy Harlow for a part time position as reading Title One reading teacher and at Kern Hatton. I, I don't think it's just a Title One. Title One intervention. interventionist at Kern Hatton. Yeah. Okay, so additional discussion or comments, questions? So um, the, the question is have we offered her a, a position at uh, one of our other buildings? Uh, my understanding is she's only looking to uh, do a very small portions based on her retirement right. piece. Um, so she needs to stay under that. Um, when um, I believe that Kern Hatton approached her or they had a conversation. And when we talked with Kern Hatton, uh, what we've tried to do with our independent schools as opposed to hiring someone directly and placing them there is to work with those independent schools. So the person who's filling those roles understand the climate and culture of the mm -hmm. institution they're going into and, and because they might have different uh, methods of doing things. I mean, Compass mm -hmm. is not, you know, they don't follow the, uh, well, well, I'm just using Compass as an example, okay. but Kern Hatton also, they, they, their population of students is very different and whatnot. Um, and so we had not approached her about any other groups. No, that's okay. All right, any other question? Okay, motion on the floor. Again, this is an SU position, so I'll go through the roster. Chris? Yes. Priscilla? Yes. Team? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Mike? Yes. Jim? Yes. Jason? Yes. Okay, thank you. Unanimous. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Okay. All right. I have a question that might go into this a bit. All right. Um, I saw an advertisement yesterday for a payroll something at the SU. Payroll clerk. Um, do we have any, have we had any candidates? How long is that person going to remain in that position till we find somebody else, hopefully? So I don't have an answer for you on, on those. Um, my, my focus has been on the high school and dealing with the PCP. Um, <laughs> payroll is uh, going to be very important here. Payroll is <laughs> very, very important. I, so so let yeah, me first say, Jason, no, Jason Bishop is, is still here in place. So that's not um, Jim looking at his, um, looking at his budget and where he is and what he can afford. Um, uh, feels that he could bring on a, a person to help support that. Wow. So okay. it's it's as we're uh, looking. Um, some of this is anticipating a transition 
um, towards the end of the year where Jim Bazina um, has kind of indicated that he may be done. Um, 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 that's when, when Jim came on, we, we kind of had a, you know, he said hey, he only had a few years and I think he's, you know, his, his goal was to get us the Tyler implementation and um, we're looking, you know, within the office if there's, uh, you know, possible movement of someone. And so we want to get someone on board so that we don't have interruptions in payroll. So that's mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But Jim has not announced his retirement. Well, good. We're still time to talk still about time it. Still time to talk about it. We're working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. With, with that, we've uh, taken care of the appointments. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. The next two action items are both related to PCBs. Uh, and I understand that attorney at law, Pietro, uh, he is, here. is yes. with us. And we did have scheduled a report on the PCBs at the high school. We also have a discussion of the Monsanto suit. And I don't know whether it's the board's pleasure. We had it sequenced that we would get an update uh, on what's going on at the at the high school. And that might be actually helpful background for the for Pietro as as well. Just a few minutes about that. I think it's no action is um, intended here. It's the Perhaps the high school reporting to us about what's going on there. What's your sure. What's your advice about this? I, I see Pietro though. Welcome, Pietro. Uh, I can give a very brief um, update of where we are. If that's um, so, on Thursday, um, right at the close of business, uh, we received um, notification from uh, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation um, that PCB. PCBs were detected in the air sampling uh, that was done here at the high school. Um, and some of those numbers and what they do is they give you a, a quite a, they section, they cordon off different areas and, and, and um, identify different areas. And, uh, and so the gymnasium and the auditorium and stage um, all came back at higher than 300 nanograms uh, per cubic feet, um, and what if it, anything is over 300, you have to have immediate action, and um, we are not able to use those um, areas until those numbers come down uh, below 300. Um, the rest of the building, uh, with the sampling, um, there were some other areas adjacent to the lock, uh, the gymnasium, so the locker rooms were also deemed, even though they weren't tested, they were deemed um, to not be usable. Um, Ms. O'Ryan and her team has already made um, adjustments to find uh, other locations within the building for uh, to accommodate the early sports programming that takes place. Um, so we could continue that without interruption. Um, and the numbers throughout the rest of the building, they range anywhere from below 100, which is the, the level the state uh, puts down is uh, acceptable, um, all the way up to just under 300. So they don't pass over that 300, but they're, all of our spaces are usable. Um, and so what we have to do is uh, we have to, the high school board needs to choose an option. We have three options. Option one, is that we begin uh, mitigation or remediation immediately. We have up to a year uh, to complete those, but because of where the levels are throughout the whole building, that would mean that the building is unusable. So option one is really not an option for us. Um, option two and option three are very similar. It allows us to continue to use the spaces uh, as we need. Option two, um, though, if the board chose to do that, would limit um, students and staff to being in the, the building for 26 hours for the whole week. Um, and so um, a regular school day for five days is longer than 26 uh, hours. Option three uh, would uh, allow for unlimited access. Um, but with the both of those option two and option three, it's based on what works best for us is how the state has uh, put it to us, um, but allows, um, we have to begin mitigation within six weeks. Um, 
part of that is bringing a consultant on board that's already approved by the AOE. We've already done that. Um, we met with the AOE and the Department of Health and DEC, um, Department of Environmental Conservation, on Friday morning. Um, we met with them again. Twice on Monday. Twice on Monday. <laughs> Thank you for that memory. Um, we've been in constant communication with them. Um, we are hosting a community meeting, high school board meeting at the middle school um, tomorrow night. The only purpose for it being at the middle school is we don't know what type of a out, you know, turnout will come out, and we don't have an auditorium that we can access here. So we're, we're having it there just uh, to accommodate uh, any crowd. Um, we will be having a uh, closed staff meeting uh, just before that. Both of those meetings, the Department of Health, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, um, will be coming down in person. Uh, to answer questions and to speak with staff, but also to speak with community members and answer questions. Um, we've also invited our local legislators um, to attend um, because um, there's a large cost involved in all of this and there's not enough money um, set aside at the state level to handle all of this. We, uh, you know, so, um, however, the state has said that once we have chosen an option and get our paperwork from DEC, uh, we can begin um, mitigation measures and those those costs are 100% reimbursable. So that's kind of where we are at this point. We're, we're uh, you know, still trying to unpack a lot of stuff, um, but I, again, you, you saw it here today and heard it today, but uh, Miss O'Ryan and her entire team, uh, Jeff Potter, who's new coming, you know, on as the head of maintenance, they have stepped up tremendously uh, to take the lead on this, um, to look at all options and outcomes, um, thinking well ahead um, of next outcomes. So, kind of where we are. That's outstanding. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd like to ask Jason, you as as board chair for the high school, to make a comment just to build on what Andy said. I mean, there's no doubt that Kelly O'Ryan, the principal, and all the team here have done a great job, and so has the superintendent and staff stepped up. But so is the board. So I wonder if you'd give uh, people just a little more sense of the board's involvement. Uh, we've been here a lot this week, um, and uh, you know, Andy hit it. Right, the nail right on the head, except it's uh, not a square foot, it's a square meter. Um, but, uh, you know, I, he said it perfectly, so we're, we're all in this together. We look forward to tomorrow and getting some answers, and hopefully from uh, Pietro, we give us some answers. Wish he was here in person, but... Uh, Understood. It's a, it's a drive. Um, I, I will say, you had a building and grounds committee meeting um, Monday, I think that was. Yeah. yeah. And, and, today, yes. today, yeah. and yeah, you know, there were a number of community members there, but that's a committee of four, and we had nine out of ten board members there as well. You know, just a real demonstration of commitment and interest on the on the part of the board taking it all really very seriously. Yeah. And I would also add we also have had people from other boards show their support and wanting to be part of the solution. So as a new board member of Bell's Fall Union High School, we appreciate the community, not just board members, but community members of really helping us as we navigate this. And I think Priscilla showed up to a meeting when we weren't even having a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's dedication. All right. That's good, Priscilla. I don't want to cheat her. I have my days next time. <laughs> so, I, so I came yesterday, Monday, which we had, um, Tuesday, which we didn't have, and then I came today. <laughs> So, yeah, with that, let's give Pietro kind of the speaker's view so we can see him a little. I, I tried to do that a couple of times and I keep getting just back TV. So that's, let me try. And then if Pietro right. starts speaking and it grabs you, Pietro, then we're in good shape here. Well, you, you know, the problem is never me start, starting speaking. It's always stopping me. <laughs> Pietro, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight on relatively short notice. You know that the topic of the Monsanto soup has been on our minds and now that's kind of exacerbated by the news at the high school. So if you could give us a briefing on the Monsanto suit uh, that you have filed 
on behalf of a number of plaintiffs, including four school districts within the supervisory union. And I know that we had a chance to at least send along to you some questions that have already been generated by the board. So please, uh, by some board members, I, I would say, and we'll be open to others tonight, but just dive into it, help us understand where we are, and then we'll open it up to questions after you've given us some remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Can everybody hear me all right? I, I'll, I'll try and keep my voice up. Um, so look, uh, I, I have been representing school districts for a long time. And when the legislature passed the statute that required testing for PCBs in schools, uh, I meet, immediately understood that this was going to potentially be an incredibly expensive undertaking for districts throughout the state. And as, as we proceeded forward, uh, and testing began. Uh, it started with the, what happened in Burlington, and it's continued on now, even with your high school in Bellis Falls. Um, we have been discovering, as is the case almost everywhere, if you have a building that was constructed from the 1930s all the way up to the late 1970s, it is highly probable that you have PCBs in the building. And what I understood is that it was going to be incredibly expensive um, to mitigate or remediate where the uh, the amount, the exposures in the air exceeded action levels. But more than that, I also understood that, you know, having lived in Vermont almost every year of my life, uh, I understood that our communities were not going to be eager if they found out that there was just a little poison in our school, something less than the action levels, but still uh, PCBs in our school and, ex and exposures for our students and our staff that they were not going to be eager for those PCBs to remain in our school. And I knew that, that to fix this problem was going to be incredibly expensive. I also realized that the state of Vermont would never come up with enough money to pay for the fix. And in fact, the legislation um, that passed in the last uh, legislative session allocated $32 million to pay for the problem. That $32 million is divided like this. 16 million for Burlington and 16 for everybody else. Uh, I, I will tell you $16 million is going to be a drop in the bucket. And so when I hear um, that, that the state of Vermont says, oh, don't worry, it's going to be paid for, I, I'm thrilled. I hope that's true. I am deeply, deeply skeptical that there is going to be nearly enough money to pay for all of the work that needs to be done. And I think you know that that some of the school districts that are neighbors of yours are are doing work in their schools that is incredibly expensive to deal with PCBs where it is above the action levels in the ambient air. So so when as I thought about this issue, um, I started also talking to people about the potential of bringing a claim against Monsanto because I knew that those kinds of claims existed throughout the country. Um, we saw that Burlington went its own way, but but you all joined a lawsuit with 93 school districts. That is virtually every school district in the state joined in this litigation. And the, the hope is that we can prevail and be able to obtain for you the costs of fixing um, the parts of your school that is removing the PCBs and mitigating in areas where it's above and even below the action levels. Our, our goal, I, I think your goal, and ultimately, these are your decisions to make, but I think your goal is to get PCBs out of your school so that if you do some renovations in the future, you don't stir them up and all of a sudden we've got PCBs in the air and we have to deal with this issue again, right? So so um, I, I, I sought out lawyers who I knew to be expert in PCB litigation, lawyers who have tangled with Monsanto before around PCBs. Uh, those are the two law firms, the Onder Law Firm and the Fraser Law Firm. And they have depositions of all the important Monsanto witnesses already. They understand who are the appropriate experts to sponsor our claims. And what, what they don't know and what I know is school districts. And so I, I, have, um, I have asked them to participate on what I'll call the Monsanto issues. And our firm is um, working with all of the school districts in the state, coordinating um, the work that needs to be done, notifying Monsanto so that if they need to come and watch the work being done, they can. And understand this, when Monsanto comes, 
They come with, with written protocols that we've agreed to, among which is that they cannot interfere with the work you're doing, they can't slow it down, and they can't make it cost you more money. If they want to observe it, they're welcome to do it, but they cannot do anything that makes it harder for you to operate your school. So we, we, um, we are pursuing this claim in federal court on behalf of almost every school district in the state, and it is costing um, our districts nothing. It is on a contingent fee basis. Um, also, and, and perhaps just as importantly, all of the expenses in the case are being fronted by these firms from out of state. So um, the very sizable costs associated with experts, with any testing that they need to do, with depositions, with the cost of deposing alter other, the other side's experts, all of those things are being paid for by the firms from out of state. So I, I was satisfied that this was a situation that was favorable and desirable for your district. Um, I then sent out uh, retention letters to superintendents of all the districts in the state who did not belong to the Burlington lawsuit. So almost everybody else and, and almost everybody else decided they would participate in this case. So there were some questions and let me see, to the extent that I have not answered the questions, I, I will go through them one at a time. Cheryl sent me an email. I'm grateful for that. Um, first of all, wh where does the superintendent have the authority statutorily to sign the retention agreement? The answer is this. Uh, under Vermont statutes, the superintendent of schools is the CEO of the district. The CEO of the district has the inherent authority to sign um, documents like retention agreements for litigation. That's not to say that the board can't countermand. And if you, for, for example, tonight said to me, thanks, but no thanks, we're not interested. I, I, I would say to you, that is your authority as a board. You can make that decision. Um, second question, who are the Onder and Fraser law, law firms? I think I told you that. They are the what I'll call the people I consider to be the PCB experts. They have litigated against Monsanto on PCBs, and they have settled cases for very sizable amounts. Um, what is our potential exposure under the language of, of paragraph seven? Um, I, we, you, have, you have no exposure under paragraph seven, except if you wait until late, late in the case, right? And, and that says that if you withdraw after they've spent millions of dollars, you, you might have to pay 193rd or 293rd of what those costs were. Um, and if you say to me, you want out tonight, you pay zero, you're done. Because they, they have not yet expended those funds. And if, the, if you say halfway through, you want out, what I would say to you is, you're out. We're not gonna, we're not gonna bother you for a couple of thousand dollars. We're not gonna do it. Um, so, what, so does paragraph 10 nullify school districts uh, participating in the lawsuit unless the districts ratify? No, our view is that that the superintendent of schools is the CEO of the districts and he can sign. If you as boards think otherwise, you can withdraw. But I would say to you, there is safety in numbers. Uh, you know, that, that 93 dual school, when I was in school, they used to say that 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. And uh, 93 school districts are, are probably right. And this is, I think, a, a statement that, you know, our communities should not have to bear the cost of fixing this problem. And, and you now know because you have the problem in a way that you didn't realize before last Thursday. Um, now that we know there are PCBs in the high school, does this suggest liability by knowingly sending students or teachers back into the school? Look, what I, I, I've actually spoken with Andy about this. He was very concerned about this issue. What, what do we do? What are our liabilities? What is the responsible thing to do under these circumstances? And what, what I told Andy, and I'll share with you, is that we need to follow the advice of the experts. And the Department of Health, the Agency of Education, DEC, you know, they've spent a lot of time working through and thinking about these issues. And we need to be able to rely on them and we need to follow their advice. And if their advice is a little bit um, uh, inconvenient, so be it. 
or if their advice, some of us, uh, you know, think maybe it's not quite as good as it ought to be, not as cautious as it should be. I, I would suggest to all of you that from a liability perspective, from a from a responsibility perspective, following that advice is is very safe. Um, and, and I think Andy discussed with you the three options that were available and and which of the options that have been considered and decided upon by the state you will choose. That's, you know, that that depends on your local sensibility. Um, and, and I think the, the last question, Cheryl, forgive me, I, I don't have that last email up now. Was there one other question you wanted me to answer? Yes, I have it right here. Mr. Clark, identify yourself. Okay. Uh, Pedro David Clark, representing Westminster on the Union High School Board. I just want to begin by saying, Nice to see you in fine form tonight. I always appreciate the earnestness of your presentations, and this is certainly a corker so far. So good on you. Now, that question, Pietro, was this. Taking note of the fact that the federal lawsuit, which Andy shared with us yesterday, so I'm a slow reader. I haven't really made it through there to read for comprehension, but there were a couple things I noticed. One thing I noticed is that um, the lawsuit alleges that damages could run into the millions, if not billions of dollars. And that's one pretty fat payday for uh, the lawyers, present company, accepted, of course, because I realize that uh, you have our best interest in mind in launching this lawsuit. But it does raise questions, Pietro. And the, the question is this. Um, that implies a much more serious situation, including teardowns, one of the remedies you suggested in the lawsuit, which may be necessary in order to uh, remediate PCB um, contamination and bring levels down to a safe level, which, of course, a teardown would mean uh, nothing at all um, and a new building. And in that regard, yeah, I appreciate the fact you go in for the billions because that's probably what it would take. But, 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 but here's the question. The question is trying to, um, I would refer to it as square the evidence which the uh, Department of uh, Environmental Conservation presented us with on Monday with the allegations that um, some of our buildings may in fact be teardowns. And it uh, presents a couple of problems because of course, um, I think that that way, way, way overstates the conditions uh, which are known at this point with this building. And I do wonder if it prejudices the Union High School Board in uh, making a decision wh whereby we would use this building at all and not completely seek uh, safer um, accommodations to conduct school somewhere else. That's a very serious uh, consideration that this board needs to be thinking about because if the allegations which are made in your suit um, are accurate, then that's something that this board needs to seriously consider. So I am very much interested and how you square the um, serious allegations which are made in your suit with the data which has been returned so far by Department of Environmental Conservation. And um, you are the expert, so I'm you know, essentially hanging on your every word. Thank you, Cheryl. So may I answer, David? <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and by the way, D David and I are old friends, and uh, I, I always feel like he should have been a lawyer. Um, so, 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 so David, look, it, it is it is an excellent question. Let me see if I can answer it. Um, what, what you are asking is how, how can we claim that there may be buildings in the state where a teardown is required? Um, and the answer is just look at Burlington. Um, Burlington is a place where ultimately the decision was made to tear it down because uh, the judgment was that it was otherwise unsafe. Now, there may be other buildings in the state. Uh, we, we have not gotten through testing with all of these buildings. And it is important in the documents we file with the court to preserve the ability to, to respond to each situation differently. 
I'm not alleging that that your high school is a teardown. It may or may not be. Uh, you know that that is going to depend on the the readings um, that are the testing and the exposures that exist within the high school. I mean, and and on that basis, you as a board will make decisions about what is safe. Now, you ask me, how do I talk about uh, hundreds of millions and potentially billions? It's easy. The, the cost of, of getting rid of PCBs, all PCBs from 93 different school districts with multiple buildings is going to be tremendously expensive. It just will. And so I, I, I don't think that is in any way a gross exaggeration. You know, we, we have not yet tallied up the cost. That's part of what we're going to do in this litigation. It's part of what we will be litigating. But, but that is, we think, a recoverable damage for your districts. If, the, if you want to be rid of PCBs, and I've never met a district yet, if given a choice, wouldn't get rid of poison in their school, then it's a legitimate uh, measure of our harm, of the damages in the case. So, I, you know, like I, I understand um, the concerns you have. And let me address one other concern, David, that you raised, not now, but in general, because I think it was a really astute observation. Um, look, I, you know, like you have plans for your high school. They may have been derailed by 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 the recent PCB readings. And and David understandably expressed to me a concern that he didn't want the litigation and, and what you had to do in connection with the litigation to interfere with your ability to do ESSER work. And I, I what, what I said to him and what I would say to all of you is that it, it won't. Um, our, the one the one caveat, like the one a condition that I've placed on Monsanto, and we've had a very cooperative relationship around their activities, um, is that we we will not let them do anything that interferes with schools doing what they need to do to educate kids. And all we ask for when you're going to do work in your schools is two weeks notice. So if you're going to do mitigation work or you're going to do testing, um, just give us two weeks notice. Andy sent us something about work you were going to do on your phone system. Well, that, we don't need to give them notice of that. But, but, but it, you know, look, just give us notice. And as long as we give them two weeks notice, Monsanto's fine. And, and they can't get in the way of what you're going to do. And I would say this. I think they're mindful that, that it is a very bad look for them if they are seen to be trying to browbeat or shut down schools. Um, and and stop the education of our students. So, I, David, you didn't ask that now, but I, I know that's a legitimate concern that not just you, but all board members would have. So now now that I'm done talking, David, have I addressed the, have I answered the question? The actor, you've done a pretty good job, um, but there is a little bit of a follow-up here. I think as you're well aware, um, a large part of the remediation cost for Burlington were to remediate the soils, which also were very heavily contaminated by PCBs. We haven't gotten outside of the building yet. Um, at least DEC hasn't. And I think we're going to have to have uh, some form of consideration for that potential contamination as well before we really know which direction we're headed in here. But um, this is a, this is a question which I am uh, seeking your legal counsel on, and that is at what point will we know what the split is between the districts? If our remediation costs are relatively minor and Green Mountains, our neighbor just to the north, are relatively major, um, how's the money going to be divided and when will we know when that division will take place? Yeah, so that's that's another excellent question. So th this is um, this is how it will be divided up. Um, everybody is going to have costs associated with uh, PCBs, and those costs are going to be allocated to each district. and And assume for a moment we settle the case. And look, we could lose. I mean, that's just the nature of litigation. We could lose, but but assume that we reach a settlement or there is a verdict. Everybody will get a pro rata share based on the actual harm suffered. It's so so everybody will you know to each to each a, a percentage of what what their harm is. Hopefully that's a hundred percent. Thank you, Pietro. Right. And in, in just a final remark, I fully understand, and I hope that the boards do too, 
that um, if you win, we win, and if we win, you win, but we would all lose together. So thank you. Yeah. And David, right. let, let me say this. I'm sorry, Cheryl. I just, you know, one of the things that I always enjoy about David is he keeps me super honest. You know, like he keeps me on my toes. Thank you. What I'm going to do now is I'll open it to questions, but uh, Andy, you had a comment in response to one of, I think, David's comments. Yeah, yeah just, uh, David, we had asked the, um, the state about the uh, outdoor sampling and what Evan from DEC had told us was, or Greg had told us, pardon me, um, from the, um, it's your, cult, your oh. consultant? Consultant, yeah, I'm trying to think of the initials of his company, I apologize. They did do air sampling outside. They didn't do soil sampling, but they did do air sampling outside and there were none found. It's just, they didn't make it into that initial report well, we get. And it weren't the air, it was the soil. No, I understand that. So, so we would work with them on potential soil, but they did do testing outside of the building, so. Okay, so I see other questions around the table, but thank you for that summary of Pietro, and now we'll get some additional questions. Chris Kibbe, and then June. Hi, Pietro. Chris Kibbe. Hi, Chris. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Salutations. Um, so just first an observation for uh, you guys know this very well, but I believe that we don't know. We just know there's PCBs in the air. We don't. We don't even know which of the materials in the school they're actually in. So, nor do we. <laughs> we do not know yet. Right, and and so we don't know what the remediation costs are. They could be enormous. They could they could be small. So I just want to keep that into perspective. Right? We're only like step right here with this, and we got a long way to go. Even though we do, I believe what you have to, within ten days you have to choose one of the options. On Friday at three a.m. Yeah. Okay, that's my comment. But so uh, my question, though, Pietro, is my understanding there is a has this attorney general also filed a lawsuit against Monsanto, and how would this work on behalf of the school, all the schools? So. How does this work with yours, unrelated? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I've been in conversation with the lawyers for the state. They, they hired PCB lawyers, too. They, you know, the attorney general's office doesn't have a lot of experience doing that work, so they hired PCB lawyers. And, and look, the conversation that I've had with them is this, that, that I, I understand that there may be reasons why the state would want to be involved for the $16 million. That, that they will reimburse, um, that makes sense to me, but that's a drop in the bucket. And um, you know, the, the state is not suing as the district. And so the concept that the state would be able to step into your shoes, um, first of all, we don't know if a court will recognize that. There are no, no cases in Vermont that I'm aware of that would support that contention. But just as importantly, it, it, let's assume for a moment they could, the money would go to the state. It wouldn't go to you. And, and and you know we don't we don't know why or when or for how much they're going to settle and nobody's going to ask you about whether they ought to settle and all of that Chris you know causes me to believe I you know what I've articulated to them is that I, I'm I, I'm not going to give up you know the claims for my client districts the people I've been working with for you know 15 20 years um, on a you know on the concept that the state knows better about how to litigate your community's money that doesn't seem right to me. And by the way, I don't think the state would be litigating the removal of all PCBs. I think they'd be talking about just the cost for those areas that are above the action levels. And, you know, again, I, 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 I don't view it as a viable claim for our districts where, you know, you want to be in charge of your own case. And you want, if it works, as David said, if you win, you want the money, not, not the general fund. Okay, thank you, Jim. Hi, Pietro. June Street here. I'm on, uh, I represent Westminster on the high school board and the high school board on the Axiom board. Um, without due respect, um, do you feel that you would have a 
conflict or a perceived conflict with the potential that if you win this case, your firm has potential of making some major money. Um, do you feel that there is a conflict or perception of conflict to advise the high school on anything related to PCBs? That is that is such an excellent question. Uh, look, so the short answer is no, and let me tell you why. Um, th th my obligation as a lawyer is to do what is best for your districts. And th th like, there's nothing else besides that. And I, I hope that by virtue of the advice that I just gave you, which was um, do what the state, what the DEC, what what the um, what what the health de department and the agency of education tell you you ought to do, is is proof of that. I, I, what I'm saying, I want I want what is good for your districts. And um, this litigation, I, yes, um, we're doing a ton of work with districts all over the state around this litigation. But it, 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 if it works out, great. And if it doesn't, we're willing to live with that. But in the meantime, you know, we represent about 90% of the districts in the state. That's where our loyalty is. And no, there's no conflict. And if there's ever an issue, like if I, like I will always resolve issues in favor of districts. Like there is never a day where I'm going to tell you to do something that is better for me and worse for you. That's malpractice. And you, I can lose my law license, and I should if I ever do that. Thank you. Yes, Jason. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, PHO Jason Terry, uh, uh, Bell's Hall Board Chair. How are you? Good. Nice to, nice to hear your voice. You too. Um, so I really didn't hear an answer to David's question. Um, maybe I missed it. Um, so you're saying follow the advice of the, the DEC, but when I read over your packet here of 60,000 pages. Um, it, there's very, very strong language to me, and maybe I'm wrong, says you shouldn't be in the schools. So I'm, I'm conflicted and I'm... Look, look okay. yeah, so, so Jason, this is what I would say. The, the state of Vermont has spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And we have, we have kids to educate and we wanna do it safely. Um, and we need to rely on them in the interim. Look, I, I think that what we can all say is that given a choice, um, and if we had unlimited funds, we would do everything we could to remove PCBs from all our schools, all PCBs from all our schools. That right now is not something that we can do. We just financially can't do it. And so I, I, I'd like to be able to put you in a position where you can do it. That's what that's what we're trying to do with this litigation. No, J Jason, I don't want to. I'm not trying to run away from the question. The, what what I'm saying to you is this. I yeah yeah. Do I believe PCBs are dangerous? Yes, I do. Um, but but we we have the state of Vermont, and, and they're giving us advice, and it is reasonable in terms of trying to operate schools in the real world right now. To, to follow their advice. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Yeah. McCall. I'm not on the high school board. I'm uh, Jim McCall from the Rockingham School Board. Uh, you know, this is this is kind of a once in a lifetime or five lifetime opportunity for your law firm. I mean, this is a big. This takes you into a different league, and and I don't blame you for pursuing. It. Uh, but my concern is right here in Bell Falls, and uh, I think that your your comments about what you're telling uh, Monsanto while you're suing them for potentially billions, uh, what they can do and what they can't do, that all goes out the window once it's once it's filed because uh, judges get involved and uh, all kinds of orders come out as to what each party can do and can't do. So I think. You know, I don't blame you for what you've said because you're, like I said, you're looking at this once in a lifetime. This is like a Dalcon Shield uh, case for uh, for you and your firm. So, uh, but I think I think it's a mistake, a real mistake, for our our high school board 
to make decisions in the next week or so, or the next five days or whatever, based on this, the language in this lawsuit, or even based on the lawsuit. I think you should forget that that even exists. That's a separate world. You need to make the decision that's in the best interest of our kids in getting our kids educated. Uh, and, uh, and I, quite frankly, am not a lawyer, uh, but I think this case, or the magnitude of this case, puts you and your firm in a conflict position. And I think that the boards, and I think the SU, uh, needs to review uh, the uh, our legal representations uh, because, uh, as I said, this is this is life changing uh, lawsuit for a firm like that, and and I think that uh, we have a lot of basic day in day out things that we have to work on, and uh, I don't want to lose sight of those things, and I don't want my lawyer to be conflicted, so. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so Jim, that's, thank you. That's my and, uh, sorry to rain on your parade, but uh, no, no, they, no, no. Look, I, 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 I totally understand the comments. All, all I would say to you is, I, I agree with you that you should run your schools without thinking about the lawsuit. The lawsuit has nothing to do with your, you know, like that's it. It, it is what it is. But you should operate your schools and make decisions around PCBs in your schools, independent of the lawsuit. Martin and, and, and oh, okay, there are two questions from the, the Zoom audience. Let me go to Krista Gay first uh, on the Athens Grafton board. Hi, good evening. Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, I just wanted to mention as a fellow attorney that this fee arrangement where uh, the lawyer representing you would get a share is like totally common. And especially, I understand that this could be a potential large payout, but the fact that a lawyer would get a percentage instead of you paying them hourly is not a conflict. Additionally, as Pedro mentioned, he has a legal obligation to the client. And before any money would ever be dispersed, especially since it's in federal court, it would have to be reviewed and approved by a judge. And his ethical obligation would be to the client. And if he did anything that would be self-serving, such as recommending we take a bad settlement or a bad course of action because it would line his pockets, he could lose his license for that. So that is not a conflict, although we need we should be mindful of that. I just wanted to point out that that, that in and of itself is, is not a conflict and is quite common, especially in large cases such as this. Thank you, Krista, very much. Uh, uh, again, no, I Cheryl, yeah. can I say one more thing? Look, sure. If, if you, I, I care. I, I have been working with your district for a while now, and if if you if you think that that you really believe, and I agree with Krista, but if you really believe this is a conflict, then I I, I don't want to I don't want to be in the lawsuit. I'd rather represent your district, right? Like I I. I, I have been working for districts for a very long time. It is what I do. Thank you. I got it. Um, I think another board member, this from Westminster, uh, Margie Kern Ferry, please. You have to unmute yourself, Margie. <laughs> unmute. Got it. Thanks. I think I'm on. <laughs> um, um, my question was, what are our legal obligations to remove the PCBs given the state's uh, the state's requirements? I mean, they have a, a range of acceptable PCB levels, and we have exceeded that. Are you saying, Pietro, that we, we might be required to remove them? I, I think that this is an area where Andy has been working very closely with the state around mm -hmm. what you have to do. And he, you know, I, I would, I don't know the specifics of your building nearly as well as Andy. So I defer to him on that. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I feel like we should be focusing on what we need to do 
to make our schools safe instead of trying to focus on what the interests of the law firm are. I mean, we have to assume that the lawyers representing our district are going to represent our best interests, folks. Like, we have to trust that and focus on what we need to do to make the schools safe. Stop trying to interpret what what somebody else's, you know, they need to get paid at some point. So we just need to focus on what we need to do. And and our law firm is trying to help us do that. Bottom Thank you, line. Marge. There, there are two different issues here. First was the Monsanto case, which was brought long before we learned about the PCB issues at the high school. We have Pietro here tonight because there were questions about this Monsanto lawsuit that four of our districts have been listed as plaintiffs in. Separate from that is how to fix the high school with the guidance from the state and the leadership from Andy and this board and the principal, Orion. So please don't be confused about that. Two very discreet issues. One, our, our questions of uh, Pietro tonight were about a specific case, not about specifically fixing the high school. Over here, Team. I, ju I just want to argue that I think Pietro bringing this suit forward and going to people who are experts in like this, who have done litigation mm -hmm. with Monsanto against PTVs, is a, shows that he is looking out for our best interest. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, of course he's gonna get a big payday. He's taking on one of the biggest companies in our country who has done tremendous harm to our environment and to our communities. And so he's gonna get a big payday because this is gonna take thousands of hours of power, of research mm -hmm. and work to do this. And so I think this like, oh, you're just trying to make money thing is so disrespectful to Pietro and to his firm. He has done so much work for our district. He has never done anything to show that he is anything but looking out for the best interests of our district. And I know we want to like catch people doing things, but he's not. I really think that he is looking out for our best interest. He, this company has caused huge harm and I think they should be held accountable. And I'm thankful that they are going through this process, which is huge to hold these people accountable. They knew in 1933 that these were toxic chemicals and they sold them for 44 more years. Thank you, team. All right, let's go back to Pietro for a moment. Thank you, Margie. Uh, I wanna make maybe one uh, clarifying comment, if I may. The Monsanto lawsuit involves four school districts. It does not involve the supervisory union board. It is the districts, Westminster that's a plaintiff, Athens Grafton that's a plaintiff, Rockingham is a plaintiff, and the high school board is a plaintiff. And so that those are the boards that would take any action to withdraw from this suit if they chose to. It is at the board level. As Pietro said earlier, the superintendent as CEO had the authority to sign, at least that's the interpretation, but if the districts were to withdraw, it would be action of the individual districts. Okay. Anything Anything else for the attorney? Yes, David. Yes, I'm addressing Pietro, but I'm also addressing this board. And I would like to point out that uh, both Cheryl and I were involved when we changed law firms a few years ago and decided to go with Lynn Lynn. Blackman and Manitsky. And the reason for that was that it was clear and obvious to us at the time that uh, Lynn Law was um, both very responsive to the needs of a district like this, where we have a superintendent of schools who may need advice on special education or labor, and uh, boards would need advice from time to time on legal matters. And there has never been any question in my mind that we chose well um, when we did that. And I wanna make it absolutely abundantly clear that my advice to um, the boards in the district would be to retain Pietro's services. But I do continue to believe that Pietro is deeply uh, conflicted or at least deeply potentially
conflicted around the very large sums which are involved here in this lawsuit. And I think it behooves the Union High School Board to um, seek outside counsel, um, at least in the very immediate near term, as to how we address um, these issues. I believe that we still have a fundamental issue with um, a superintendent who of uh, uh, his own volition, and I realize that the chair and I have a difference of opinion on this. Um, I do not believe that he uh, possesses the operational authority to commit this board to a lawsuit, which is hugely consequential, uh, without the board's prior knowledge or consent. And I think that we need to sort that one out because I believe that there are, shall we say, other issues um, which are uh, attendant upon it as well. But in terms of the quality of Lynn Law's advice, th thank you, I got you. I appreciate your comment, but I believe very strongly that uh, the quality of Lynn Law's advice to these districts over the period of time which we have employed them has been for the most part sterling. I and will say I'm very disappointed that the law firm was not broached to Pietro's Lynn, Pietro Lynn's employers in this case, to the boards and not the administration. And uh, instead uh, we end up in a situation where we find out uh, almost two months after the lawsuit has been filed in federal court that we were involved in a lawsuit which we knew nothing about. But in terms of legal representation, he has done a splendid job. But this, I think, is something that we need to pay a little bit more attention to. I thank you, Pietro, for being here dialoguing with us. I'm sure Cheryl's going to do the same thing in just a moment. <laughs> David, uh, thank you for your kind words. I appreciate it. You, you have earned them, Pietro. So I think with all of that, I was about to close the discussion for this evening. Did you have anything else, Keenan, you were going to say? Well, I just, uh, it had nothing to do with Pietro. Uh, as, I, as I said, the uh, um, so far from what I've read in the paper, I think that I'm very pleased with what the high school board is doing. I want to thank you for that because it's uh, it's a you didn't sign on for this uh, for this assignment necessarily, but uh, and we all might be facing it uh, as they go through. I guess what's most that was okay. Okay. But, uh, uh, but I do think, uh, as I said uh, when I uh, tirade against uh, Pietro here, that um, uh, don't let this language in this lawsuit color your decision, make the, make the decision based on what's the best interest of the kids. And I think as long as you follow one of the recommendations of the state, you're on the right track because uh, uh, let's face it, whether we win or lose a, a lawsuit, we're gonna, we're gonna be reminding hopefully our, our, our legislative delegation that voted this law in, uh, that we want to get reimbursed is to, to the extent that we can. Um, and I think that the uh, uh, having the consultant on board uh, to assess where exactly these things are is uh, is 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 good. It's, it's nice that you have it now. Uh, and I think uh, uh, good luck. Stay cool. Stay cool. <laughs> well. Yeah, so I would I appreciate you saying that, but I think this is a very good or near perfect example of the board, the high school administration, and the SU working together to meet the needs of our students, our faculty, and our community. And so with that being said, that, that this is what we were supposed to be doing, is working together. And I, I'm proud of the people that have been in meetings over the last three days, because you didn't, some of them didn't have to be there. And we had people outside of the high school at these meetings as well. So this is why we do what we do. And I'm proud that we're working with the three uh, arms to be able to help and represent our community. All right. I think um, it, 
Are there additional questions for Pietro? That's uh, well, he might have to answer this one. All right, go ahead. Uh, uh, um, Westminster has been tested. Westminster School has been tested and they're fine. But, so why are they in the suit? Yeah, so, so remember, when they do the testing, it's just of the air. It doesn't mean that your school is PCB-free. We got the same kind of report back that the high school got back. Mm -hmm. We got it in March, I want to say, end of March. Uh, and it showed no evidence of PCBs. Well, but that doesn't mean they're not there. He also said that, that if... That there's like a renovation that happens, they can be stirred up and then be present. Okay, okay. correct. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Pietro? All right. Thank you so very much on behalf of all of us. Thank, yes. you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, Cheryl, so let me say this to everybody. Thank you. I appreciate um, your time and uh, your some of your kind and some of your unkind words. And, you know, I will uh -huh. reflect on, on the criticisms and the compliments. And I thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. So that takes us down to director comments and the date and time of the next meeting. Let me make a comment about date and time of next meeting. We have been talking for a while about training. I don't care for that word exactly. Professional development opportunities for board members. And Andy and I have been talking about a cycle, and we've talked about it in this uh, context as well, such that the second, let me get this right, it's, the, it's first and third Wednesday. So the third Wednesday of each month would be our regular meeting normally, where we try to address first would be regular. I think it was just the opposite. No, first, I think it's a third. First, it's a, first, right, is first a yeah, first is if we need one. Exactly. The third is sure. our regular. Right. Right. The other ones are that way. That's right. Like so, yeah. <laughs> we're, uh, Westminster. Or, yeah, 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 we're not going to go. Going on a little sleep. So I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so at any rate, it's the third Wednesday of each month is our regular meeting where we try to put all the business in it. And this was an exception because of going back to school. And we, we didn't want to have it too early for the principals and staff and such. But in this model, the first uh, Wednesday of each month would be the one where we have an opportunity to get additional training. Keep in mind that the board chairs are required to get eight hours a year of training. So we're doing this designed program where we can all learn. I would say the SU board can host the training. Other board members from other boards are absolutely welcome to join. And so we've looked at the first Wednesday of September, September 6th, being our next uh, training session with our regular meeting then uh, on the on the third Wednesday. So Jason's already got some questions. Quite a few people have questions still about open meeting law. What does that mean? Some of the communications policies. I think we've talked a bit about getting some help around um, some of the law around hiring practices, how to hire people, what's legal, what's not. Some things about harassment and bullying. So we're looking at creating a schedule uh, for us, again, keeping in mind that the training opportunities, the first Wednesday of each month, and our regular business uh, on the on the third. And any time we need to hire somebody or have some of that kind of urgent business, we'll put it up for that uh, training meeting as well, like we did tonight. So with that, um, one of my, I've, I've been trying to get as much counsel as I can to serve in your, in this role as chair. And one of the things I've learned recently that in director's comments, we ought to speak only to the topic of items that were on the agenda for a specific mm -hmm. meeting, not to raise new issues. And the reason for this is because open meeting law wants the constituents to always know what the big issues are that are being addressed. And if we bring up a new topic in director's comments. It doesn't give them the kind of background or preparation that a discussion in a full board meeting would need. So in inviting director's comments tonight, I'd invite any comments that relate to our agenda tonight. Broadly speaking, back to school, PCBs or the Monsanto suit, <laughs> but not really anything else that could be something that ought to be an agenda item for a properly board meeting, if that makes sense. Okay, so with that, 
I was thinking about even waiving the Rutgers comments tonight, because uh, but I'm open to them if anybody wants to make a comment. Sure. I do. And uh, uh, noting uh, the exception, Cheryl, which you have just provided about discussing items which were not on the agenda tonight, um, I uh, want to address the WNESU board and say that I am aware that there were board members who were uncomfortable with my remarks made at the end of the last meeting. And I further acknowledge the fact that that disapprobation was clearly expressed by the chair at the time. And I want to say that to those who have taken exception to the tone of my remarks, and uh, I also direct this uh, especially at you, Karen, I do apologize. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other board members want to make a comment tonight? It looks like Jim does. Uh -huh. I always do. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, on the theme of going back to school, uh, the uh, and the fact that we can't talk about things that we asked to have on the agenda that are not have not made it to the agenda. Uh -huh. uh, one of the big things that was left out of the presentations here was busing. Uh, we're about to take uh, possession of our seven new buses to the rest of our huge fleet. And um, the uh, the administration was tasked with uh, a busing policy procedure that would ensure that the utilization of the bus fleet would stay below a certain number. Um, and uh, that wasn't discussed here tonight, nor if you're going to do education or, you know, what board members uh, think. I'll attend by Zoom. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think there's a, a number of pressing issues about going back to school. I mean, about, for example, the staffing at special ed people at the, at the, at the Bells Falls Middle School that are quite important and a hell of a lot more important than uh, board training, okay? I I would say if, if things get slow in February, uh, I'd put more emphasis on board training, quite frankly. I think there's a lot of business that uh, uh, didn't get done during the summer. I know speaking from the Rockingham board, uh, we, we had a couple of major issues that we were expecting reports on uh, during the summer that we never got it. And of course, now the PCB thing is like COVID. It's going to, it's going to put everything back. So my feeling is we have business to do. Uh, we got financials. We got this new system coming in, you know. <clears throat> so again, I would just, uh, I would say that there's a number of back to school issues that are con still concerning me. And, uh, and I think that there are there are a number of things that are higher priority than uh, board training. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, I'm here. Since we were talking about classrooms today, a lot, and with some of the exciting things that are going on, I was wondering what we would look like as a classroom here today. Uh, seriously, I mean that seriously. And, uh, um, you know, how we will just listen to each other, how many people start to speak and not speak. Um, having been a teacher myself for a long time and back and forth, it's just an observation. And I think maybe we don't, you know, like it was saying, if we don't have training, but I think an observation of, since we're educators or people who care about students, how, how might we assess ourselves in terms of our capacity to be a collective and caring for one another and someone says something follow on with that person other than myself well thank you so much you know June, for that comment it made me think about this or that so it just i got me thinking about classrooms today thank you thank you i get it um i really enjoyed the discussion with what the principals had to say uh, what they're doing to welcome um, the students back and, and the parents and the community and especially like meeting all the directors and what they did and um, I mean I, I didn't know a lot of them 
some of them I did I do know, but um it was just nice to hear what they're doing sure. for the kids, um, for for the, the community and the and the parents. Um I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Like to ditto what she said. I didn't really know the inner workings I and mean, it helped me a lot to broaden my vision a little. <laughs> Anybody, anybody else, Jason? Oh, Priscilla first, and then Jason. Right, Jason. I'm just looking something up. I would, I'd just like to thank uh, my fellow board members who are here again. Um, there's seven high school board members here tonight. I think there was six or seven at the grounds meeting today, and all of us on Monday. And um, you know, it's really important that we are, like what Rob said, you know, fostering good teamwork and good communication up and down from administration. And my director comment would be, um, <clears throat> it's gonna be interesting tomorrow when we're at the middle school, what the turnout will be and what the concern is gonna be. And I think that's gonna weigh heavily on how we proceed. So uh, look forward to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, I was trying to look up because Jake said, um, we mentioned the bus thing, and I think Andy just for the board's clarification that you went from fifteen thousand miles per bus per year to sixteen thousand miles per bus okay. per year, and you have in there how much, how many cents per mile it is over that. Um, and I I had heard it was twelve cents, and somebody asked me the other day, and I it was a lot more, but I can't. I was trying to find it. I can't find you. So maybe just updating us when you get a chance would be would be nice. Um, but I think you did a nice job at, at clarifying that. So just wanted to say that, you know, in response to what we asked you to do, that it was done. I look forward to the school year. I hope that all Board members in particular visit because I think it's a beautiful thing to go into our schools and just just at least greet people and say hi. Um, because I came on the wrong day yesterday, <laughs> I got to meet our new assistant principal at the high school, and that was delightful. I got to say about two sentences to the hi and greet her because it was a busy time, but it was a nice thing to have happen. Um, and, Love that for everybody. Just that saying hi to people makes a big difference because we want to encourage that interaction of people and that friendliness um, and not be so distant that we can't be friendly. We do need to keep board um, required things that are going to come before the board at meetings, but it is nice to be able to have community conversations with people. And, and to do those kind of things and see how nicely our administration is working and how hard they're working to make our schools run nicely. And if we can encourage people to be pleasant, supportive, kind, parents, children, and board members, and all community members, I think it's important. Thank you. I'd like. Yeah, uh, you know, on the high school board, we're facing some really difficult decisions. And we're hearing from all the experts, we're hearing from the state, we're hearing from the lawyers, we're hearing from the administration. Uh, but for me, uh, it's critical to hear from the parents. So I think our meeting tomorrow night, I really want to encourage parents to show up and let us know what they want because it's their children. Uh, we will hear from the teacher, I'm not sure if they're allowed to attend that meeting, but I'd love to hear more directly from the teachers who are also going to be in this building what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Uh, to me, you can't make this decision without really having strong input from the community. So I just really want to encourage the parents to show up and let us know what they want. Any other comments from anyone? I would entertain a motion um, that each board chair might uh, entertain a motion to adjourn so we can, by acclamation, perhaps adjourn all boards at the same time, beginning with the supervisory union board. 
a motion? I would like to have just all of the boards adjourn without, with, if there is no objection. Yeah, thank and you. So therefore, if Cheryl, if you could do that for all boards, I think that's all that we need to do, just say that if you would adjourn all boards, unless there's, yeah, unless there's an objection, take care of it. should we have all boards, boards adjourn? Yeah, yeah. You know, all right. <laughs>